For as long as art has been around, we've had a perception of the artist. And when looking at seemingly most well-regarded literature, especially from modernity, we see the artist in pain. There's a notion that that pain, or even mental illness, is what fuels truly great art. That it allows an artist to dig deep and rip out all of their agony and splash it onto the page. In more extreme cases than what we'll primarily be looking at today, we find the tortured artist, also known as the tortured genius. And while this is clearly a romanticism of severe psychiatric illness, is there any merit to it? Does the tortured artist really exist? Does being mentally ill help you create better or at least more meaningful art? That is my mission for the day. And for a brief summation of my answer, well, yes and no. Let me explain. We first need to break down what creativity even is. I mean, really think about this one. What is a genius? What does it mean to be creative when there are so many things one can be creative about? Is a good painting any more or less valuable than a great business strategy? Let's stop in here on the bush here. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think creativity is, which means I have a sad reality to tell you. You have never come up with a good idea in your life. In fact, you have never come up with any idea in your life. Originality doesn't really exist. For a simple explanation, any idea you can possibly have is formed by your mind. But your mind is formed by your interactions with other beings and the environment around you. It's influenced by other ideas, meaning your ideas, the ones that come from your mind, are some combination of other ideas. For the full horrific implications of this, watch this video after this one is over. And sorry in advance. For the sake of this video, however, we'll be taking a look at this a different way, and think of this more in a quantum level. The collective consciousness, as Lane would call it, represents this, well, collective that we interact with. Think of this as everyone and everything else, a vast ocean that constantly influences waves to form other waves, and you are just one single burst of energy within that. But inside that collective consciousness are also possibilities. When looking at it from a mathematical or quantum point of view, we see that any possible idea, itself being a combination of other present or even future ideas, is there. I say future because we can use even those potential ideas to try and predetermine what ideas may come to being next. It's all quantifiable, even if only by some omniscient supercomputer. Let's think of it this way. You have a carton of apple juice and a carton of orange juice. When poured out into different individual glasses, each of them represents an idea. Of course, we know these ideas. I mean, it's just a glass of orange or apple juice. However, while no heathen would dare to do it, there is a known potential that you could always do when no sane man has ever done before and combine both glasses into a new mysterious beverage, creating a completely new idea. Oh God, what are you doing? The potential for combination is always inherently there simply because the initial components exist and are non-material. Even if there were 60 million different fruit juices, it would still be as simple as getting a bigger glass. Even if you have 60 million ideas, it would still be as simple as writing a book trilogy instead of a single poem. These fruit juices, these ideas are known existences, clearly. But I would argue that the potential ideas, the potential juice of the gods, is also already in existence within the amalgamatory network that is the collective consciousness. This is simply because it has the known possibility to exist, as well as the viable means to make it semi-material as it can eventually occupy brain matter. Not to be that guy, but this is starting to seem a bit like Schrodinger's cat. And you know I mean business since I even used a little accent over the O in the script here. This is all a long-winded way of saying that you don't actually create ideas, you discover them. You're like a miner trapped in the collective consciousness. This is often why when even very creative people try to come up with a major idea, they draw a blank. Yet can have the best ones completely by random during the famous Eureka moment. There just happened to be a certain permutation of ideas in that instance, resulting in a new, unoriginal idea. So then, what was the point of all of this? For a clever play on words, a cool twist to say you discover, not create? Well, maybe, but I think there's a wider point here. For now, we can define creativity as a whole as being more open with the collective consciousness, therefore being able to discover more ideas. But our next question is why the distinction between create and discover is so vital. What determines if someone is creative in the first place? Now, in terms of the tortured artist stereotype, we could just say that people resonate more with sad art. 
therefore deeming sad artists as more creative. That they value disturbed emotions over healthy ones. And okay, sure, but that's also an extremely boring answer. And also a non-monetizable one, so screw that. I'm talking about creativity as a whole here and how said tortured person may actually just be more creative in all aspects. And now that we've established that ideas are discovered, not created, let's take a look at who exactly is discovering these ideas in the first place. Mental illness and neurodivergency can often go hand in hand. However, it is important to make a distinction between the two. Something like autism spectrum disorder is indeed a disorder in that it's a developmental one, but it's also very highly debatable if it would even count as a mental illness. Often in how I view it, it can be seen as being part of a dual diagnosis, if something like depression is also found, which an autistic person is more highly susceptible to. Furthermore, not everyone with a mental illness is neurodivergent. Honestly, the word itself is very loosely defined, it seems, in terms of what conditions it actually covers. For now, we'll go with the basics and say it covers ASD, ADHD, and dyslexia. While mental illnesses will cover things like depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. So here's what we'll do for the purposes of this video. Now that we've laid it all down clearly here, we're going to do something we wouldn't normally do and group these two separate things together and call it mental divergence. Okay? Okay. So the question remains, how does being mentally divergent affect how you interact with the collective consciousness? Well, it's quite drastic and it's also on a scale. This is actually pretty simple though. If you have social anxiety, you're less likely to talk to people. In a more severe way with autism, you likely would not even know how to normally talk to people. Even if you mask, you will probably not truly feel connected or engaged in the conversation in most situations. And since ASD is a developmental disorder and this is crucial, you're going to feel this impact from an extremely early age, in your formative years. Your identity then will be impacted. This isn't to say anyone's entire identity is defined by any disorder, you are stronger than that. But speaking from personal experience, any condition form that young will have you built up in such a way where communication with others is stilted. And since it's that interaction, especially during your formative years, that forms your identity, at least in my opinion, then your sense of self will normally come out as a looser, less solidified. This is when you're being built up, but the same can kind of be applied when countering an illness that breaks you down. Although probably to a lesser degree for our terms here. Depression is the most common and can harm how you interact with people, especially if you develop it chronically from a young age. But perhaps the two most represented and honestly the two most misunderstood conditions are in this category for the most part. Bipolar disorder and schizophrenic and other schizospectrum disorders. Most of which develop in the late teens and early 20s but have childhood implications that we'll be getting to in just a little bit. And this, well, this is where things get a little complicated. In terms of creativity, the disorganized thinking and intrusive images, sometimes even hallucinations, that come with psychosis can be used in creative projects. Mania can often make people even produce more unrestrained work than usual. Images and ideas will pop into people's heads, and art is often an outlet to deal with those things. Art that others often appreciate. And in our loose definition of creativity, this does technically fall under it. However, this is not really what we're discussing today. Instead, let's look at how severe psychiatric illnesses like these affect our identity. First, let's get a bit theoretical. It's unknown what causes schizophrenia and other disorders on that spectrum, but it's been discussed that a self-disorder, also known as epseity disturbance, may be relevant here. What this is, is a disruption or diminishing of the basic sense of self one may have. And this is huge for our discussion today. This self-disturbance is present in almost all foundational texts on schizophrenia, yet is not officially considered to be an aspect of the disorder, at least from what I've read. So while we will be talking about it today, please remember to take us with a grain of salt. And that while the EASE test and other research is being conducted for official proposal for ICD-11 or International Classification of Diseases, I am not the person to decide if it's truly a part of the schizophrenic experience. All I can offer is what I've read and better yet what I've experienced to answer the question of whether this has an effect on creativity. So, for this video, we will base our analysis on the conclusion that self-disorder is a foundational symptom of schizophrenia, but please keep the disclaimer in mind. Now, depersonalization is something we've talked about a bit on the channel, with my milk inside a bag of milk inside a bag of milk analysis, but it's important to distinguish the two. Depersonalization is a disturbance of the self, yes, but not the basic self. It's kind of hard to pin down exact examples here, but I want you to think of a moment where you felt dissociated from yourself and your body. 
How did you feel? Now take that feeling, remember it, and compare it to this example taken from my milk analysis. Quote, start. When I was a child, I used to imagine that I was a video game character. This was not a logical, conscious choice, rather. It just seemed like the right direction to take my abstract understanding of the world. It made sense aesthetically. My body was nothing but an avatar, and even my movements were dictated by the analog controller that rested in my mind. Often, I would even imagine my spatial awareness to be that of a third person, partially top-down perspective, like you would commonly see in an RPG or many other video games. Every motion was calculated, and even my place in society was cast as a story, with moving parts that weren't necessarily predetermined, but still aligned with a logical streamlined structure. As if every place I could go was specifically aware that I would someday go there. I was impressed and still am that they were able to pre-render those areas of the level, although I suppose I can't be sure if they actually did. I felt like a mile of ice cream, and every space around me was occupied by my consciousness at certain points in time. My perception of reality admittedly didn't even make for a very fun video game. Sometimes it took the form of a direct-to-television VHS sequel to a Charlotte's Web. There were about 10 of those my mind created to recontextualize my life. More on that later. Quote over. Now when I say my perspective was a top-down experience, I mean it very literally. If I recount those memories, they are, and I cannot stress this enough, literally from a bird's eye view. Instead of an AMVES usually. I would also often feel like the choices and movements I made were inputs on a controller, and would even wait to move until I felt the button being pressed. I then would move in a very mechanical way. I actually did this yesterday. This feeling of external consciousness, that your sense of self resides partially or even completely outside of your body, is obsidity disturbance, something I sadly was not aware of when I made my milk analysis video. This is just one example out of hundreds, but I think it should highlight how disrupting this is towards a solidified sense of even basic self. And especially when paired with paranoid delusions associated with actual schizophrenia, you become entirely disconnected from the world and afraid of it. There's a plane. I hate planes. I live by the airport. They just keep coming. They don't stop. I try to record audio and every like 10 minutes they just come. It's come disrupt everything. Disrupt my basic self even. This disconnection comes from the fact that you often like the body or the self to properly interact with it. But here's where I pivot to my grander point. Because you cannot properly interact with the collective consciousness, you are actually more open to it. Let me explain. This is where childhood mental divergence is key, since in order to be my archetype of the tortured artist, you need to lack the solidified sense of self which almost always develops during childhood. This is the time in your life when you normally develop your own individuality, your sense of consciousness and being, and when that is disrupted, yours can be a bit flimsy. Obsidian disturbance is of course the most egregious example of this, itself literally being something that disrupts the fundamental self, but other forms of mental divergence will do this as well. Many different disorders can make you be less social as a child, less willing to socialize with others, and, very importantly, truly be open with them. An autistic child can learn to mask, but that doesn't mean they will actually be interacting with others as they are meant to, now without professional help. The sad truth is, however, that a lot of kids just won't get that help. As a child with OCD, I was forced to confront things that truly made me less willing to open myself up thinking I would die multiple times due to touching things, or that God himself would strike me down just because I used a swear word in my head. It makes you scared of the world, so you're less likely to interact with it. This applies to anxiety, especially social anxiety as well. Honestly, think of any mental or developmental disorder and you can reason at least one thing that would make said person less likely to interact with the collective and the world, thus having a less solidified sense of self. Now you may be thinking, but you just say creative ideas are found in the collective consciousness, so if people don't interact with it as much, then they'll be less creative. You're stupid. And that is a great point, but the vital part here is that you will always have to interact with it. Even if you live in the mountains, the network of influence runs through nature as well. And importantly, if you weren't raised by wolves, then you surely had parents or human guardians. Probably other family too, so it still applies. You were a child influenced by others, and if you were a child experiencing some mental divergence, then you likely developed a looser sense of self. Once you reach a certain age, you should have a solidified consciousness. 
Of course, you as a person can't change, but you are definitely a person that is possible to change. You aren't a child. And once you have a solidified self, you are less likely to be influenced by or be open to the collective consciousness. I mean, are you still as gullible as you were when you were 10? Probably not. And since ideas are simply discovered within the collective, and since you are less open to it, then you are less likely to discover said ideas. However, the looser the self, the more open you are to these ideas. Ideas that you will always have to encounter because you will always interact with the collective. As Lane says, we are all connected. You literally can't form a personality as a human would recognize it if you aren't influenced by others. So let's review. Ideas are found in the collective consciousness. Mentally diverging kids are less likely to interact with the collective properly during their formative years. But once they grow up, and especially if they learn something like masking, they interact with it anyway. Albeit with a lesser, looser sense of self. Since consciousness and being is formed through proper influence from others. The less solidified your sense of self, the more receptive you are to discovery and morphing of ideas. Even if someone is a recluse that is chronically online, they are still influenced. And hey, creative people would need creative ideas, and they'll probably make some art with them. So in summary, if we define the tortured artist as someone who is mentally divergent as a child, or an adult who has suffered enough to make their sense of self crack and loosen, then yeah, they exist. And being mentally ill or having a developmental disorder is actually likely to make you more creative. Not even just from a Sad Boy Hours playlist perspective, but even in a general sense. So, in conclusion, start chasing sadness, right? Well, no. Because while we did conclude based on literally no empirical evidence that being ill means you'll be more creative, being ill also means you're less likely to be able to produce any work at all. Someone like Van Gogh is an anomaly. Virtually everyone in his position would, sadly, probably do very little artistically. As a creative myself, I feel my work pour out of me at times. But sometimes, honestly, oftentimes, I can't get a single word on the page. Whether that be because I'm depressed that day, or that week, or that year. Or whether my executive function is just down in the gutter, sometimes when you're mentally divergent, you just can't will yourself to do anything. And this idea is consistent with almost all of them. ADHD, ASD, depression, anxiety, bipolar, in particular during depressive episodes, other personality disorders, and schizophrenia, the main disorder we've discussed today has a devastating effect on executive function. Of course, this isn't to say that if you have a mental or developmental disorder, you'll never make anything. That's not true and you are always more than a diagnosis. But what it does mean is that we can't just count being mentally divergent as this creative superpower. It's a serious thing, and it's something that can make it so, so hard to do even normal, everyday things. We can't romanticize it. We can acknowledge that, yeah, from my perspective, it probably is a big factor on how creative someone is, but we must also recognize that the amount of neurotypical people in the creative space is almost certainly just as high, mainly due to that lack of executive function. The tortured artist is real, but so real that they are also human. And humans aren't creative content machines, they fumble along the way. Thank you for making it through this video. This is part of a new series I want to try called An Honest Look, where I can go outside my comfort zone on the channel and really explore topics in media I probably wouldn't otherwise. I hope you enjoyed it. The next topic will be on anime profile pics or syndrome. You won't want to miss it. Furthermore, I recognize a flaw in this video, that these mentally divergent adults should then be less creative as children. This is something I have to think more about, but I assume since these kids are still creative that they are just less receptive to normal interaction, making them already from an earlier age more receptive to more bizarre and creative ideas. More on that thought to come in the future, maybe for a part two? For two videos that are similar in theme to this one, check out either my Loose Lane Analysis or my Doki Doki Literature Club video essay mentioned earlier. Or, honestly, even my Milk Inside a Bag and Milk Inside a Bag and Milk Analysis. That's probably the best one to look for. And for everyone new to the channel recently, welcome! And, as always, thank you for watching.